This episode of World Wellness Education is made possible by a production grant from the Millhorn Law Firm. Have you or a loved one ever suffered an injury due to the negligence of another? Then it's time to turn to a law firm that you know and trust, one with a record of client satisfaction and integrity. Hello, my name is Ryan Millhorn, and the Millhorn Law Firm has been representing personal injury clients in the Central Florida area for over 20 years. Our attorneys live in this community and are very proud to call it home. The Millhorn Law Firm, the law firm you know and trust. Hi, I'm Tracy Brosman, co-founder of World Wellness Education, a community forum to educate, encourage, and inspire a better way of life. We commonly face day-to-day -day challenges of stress, lack of exercise, and poor eating habits. But with the right approach, we can find freedom, wake up each morning feeling healthy, focused, and ready to take on the day. Together, we can make a difference, one story at a time. Heart disease is a leading cause of death for both men and women in the United States. It affects nearly all families and costs over $100 billion each year in medications, healthcare services, and lost productivity. Our guest today, Ellen Wilcox, was diagnosed with heart disease at a young age. Ellen had to make many changes and now, over 20 years later, she feels healthier than ever. Ellen is here to share her inspiring story and why she is feeling so good. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you, Tracy. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you. Well, let's start back with when you were diagnosed with heart disease. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, I was 52 years old. Uh, it was late in the evening. I had come home from teaching a class uh, on financial planning for women, which is what I do. And um, I suddenly had a terrible headache, really bad headache. And um, I never, I virtually never have headaches. And I'm virtually never sick, but I certainly don't have headaches. And uh, the headache just wouldn't go away. It felt like the top of my head was just erupting. Oh, no. And um, I finally took a couple aspirin and crawled into bed. It was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. About an hour later, I woke up and I felt like an elephant had his foot on my chest. I remembered that my mother, who had heart disease uh, at a very early age also, um, always said that um, she felt pressure on her chest, and that's what I was feeling. So I woke my husband up and I said, um, I'm not feeling well and you need to get me to the ER immediately. What happened when I got to the ER was that, um, of course, they took my blood pressure, which was 145 over 120, I remember the numbers, and that is off the charts for me. My blood pressure is normally 110 over 65, and so I have very low blood pressure. But um, I told the nurse, actually sat up on the table and promptly told the nurse that her um, equipment was malfunctioning oh. <laughs> because I certainly didn't have high blood pressure and blood pressure at that level and she gently touched my shoulder and pushed me back down and oh. onto the table and said um, please relax because I think you probably have just had a heart attack so did they see that you had had a heart attack actually that didn't come about until the next day when they started running some tests and they put me on a treadmill, and I was on it for less than two minutes, um, and it was off the charts. Oh my. And um, later, the diagnostic tools that they used showed that I did not have a heart attack, but that I had severely blocked coronary arteries, several. Oh my, so it's a good thing that you were there. It's a very good thing that I was there. I forgot to mention one thing about the, the headache. I also felt like I had a severe toothache. And um, we know now, I didn't know then, but most people do know now, that jaw pain is a significant precursor to heart disease or a, a warning, an early warning signal, signal um, for, especially for women. Men typically have chest pain and arm pain, but women very often have jaw pain and shoulder and arm pain. Okay. So it's a little different for women. Yeah, and we, we know that now. Symptoms. We didn't know it then. Right. Yeah, because yeah, this was quite some time ago that uh, this happened. 22 years ago. Wow. So what did they do for your blocked arteries? 
Uh, they did a coronary bypass. I had a triple coronary bypass, and which was pretty prevalent in those days. So I have lots of scars to show for it. <laughs> oh no! Uh, about 29 inches up my leg and about 12 inches down my chest. So it's not a fun thing, and it takes some recuperation to get beyond that. But um, right. they did do a coronary bypass. They tried an angioplasty, and uh, the doctor told me you're you're semi awake during a, an angiogram, and. Um, I was awake enough that the doctor was speaking to me and he said to me, we can't inflate the balloons anymore because your arteries are very, very tiny. I'm basically a small person. I'm small boned. Evidently my insides are small too, so especially around my heart. So they had to do something else. Yes, so they did the bypass. He said, we, have, we, we can go ahead and do the bypass now or you can go home and think about it. And I thought, go home and think about it. <laughs> no way I'm going to do that. So what I said to him was, you've got me where you want me, which was on the operating table, and you might as well just go ahead and fix the problem, is what I said to him, fix the problem. So they did. Wow. Well, tell us a little bit about your lifestyle leading up to this. Was there a lot of stress involved? Was um, there anything leading up to? Um, first of all, <clears throat> I have to say I'm a workaholic, but um, I was working very long days. Um, I was under a great deal of stress in the office. Um, my profession is uh, very challenging, as you can well imagine. And dealing and with other people's finances. De would dealing be. with other people's money is not a simple thing. And um, I also was uh, eating out at least two meals most days. Yes. And so I always cleaned my plate. And, um, and the serving sizes kept getting bigger. Uh, yes. But you still uh -huh. cleaned your Things plate. Things like that, yes. Uh -huh. So lots of pasta. Um, lots of um, lots of stress, lots of long hours, and um, also I was in a relatively new relationship with my new husband, and so um, I was very conscious of wanting to make that relationship um, extraordinarily good, which of of course it was. Now, a lot of times people will have a disease, especially like heart disease or something, where they go and have surgery for it, and then they think, okay. I've had the surgery, it was scary, but I'm okay now. Mm -hmm. I can go on to life as usual. Is that what you did? It was a huge wake-up call for me, and I agree with you that it's not a wake-up call for everyone. Uh, some people do change their, their habits afterwards, after something like that, some kind of scare, but uh, most will change their habits briefly and then gradually uh, drift back to the old ways, and I'm happy to say that that was not the case for me. Um, I made extraordinary changes. Um, I closed the office earlier. <laughs> that was one thing. Okay, um, so everybody I, benefited yes, from it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and um, I stopped working weekends. I tried to get away on weekends or do something that was fun and creative and, and enjoyable rather than stressful. And um, I, most important of all, I was fortunate enough to enter two programs that I think made a dramatic change in my life. What were they? One of them was a 12-week rehab program that my local hospital was able to support. And uh, fortunately, my insurance covered. I okay. think nowadays most reasonably good insurance does cover that 12-week program. But it was three days a week. It was every morning um, um, at, a, at a set time uh, on those three mornings a week. Um, I entered the program after just two weeks after my surgery. That's a little early by today's standards. They typically hold you back more than two weeks. Okay. But I was able to enter the program after two weeks. You were still weeks. a type A right there. <laughs> Absolutely. No, the 12-week the re rehab program was excellent. Um, every Friday we had a lecture uh, in addition to a one-hour exercise program. So it was a full one hour. It was using, um, I remember my first, my first weights were one pound dumbbells. And, um, but that's what I was doing. I was on a treadmill um, uh, with an incline up to seven degrees, which is pretty steep. If you're on a treadmill, try seven degrees. 
Um, the, I was on a, a wonderful rowing machine mm -hmm. that was a flywheel and it was calibrated in wattage and I remember trying to get enough wattage to light up a 60 watt bulb so if, when okay. it got to 60 that was sort of my goal. But it was really, um, it was really the Friday morning lectures that got me started on the right path as well as the exercise of course. But the Friday morning lectures were, um, the very first one was the anatomy of the heart and the second one was quit smoking which I never did anyway, okay. fortunately, so I was lucky in that respect. Um, raised by Quakers in Philadelphia, nice girls didn't smoke, so I never smoked. <laughs> so you never smoked. <laughs> I never smoked, fortunately. Um, and then the third week was how to clean out your pantry. And okay. I went home and tore into that pantry like you wouldn't believe and tore into the refrigerator. I was on low fat this, no fat that, and got rid of just just everything that was bad for me. So what I, did your husband think of all these changes? Um, well, he, he was very much in favor, very, very supportive. Good. Um, um, had a little problem getting my hemoglobin back up. Uh, after the surgery, and so um, I was told to eat a lot of beets, which I totally despise. I do agree with and, you there. Um, no, I still don't <laughs> like beets, <laughs> but um, it did the trick. And uh, also friends came and um, fixed freezer meals. My husband wasn't a great cook, and uh, wasn't his, his strong Forte. suit. No, <laughs> definitely not. But he um, was able to use some of the frozen food that my friends prepared. And I remember they prepared a big pot of turkey chili for me. And they prepared some chicken cacciatore that was very, very healthy. And uh, all white meat and no skin and no fat and all of that. And they put it in little baggies and brought it to a steaming hot and we popped it in the freezer and we had enough food for probably a month or more. Wow, <laughs> so, that was so really nice. were so you very could helpful. get a yes. good start on your new lifestyle. Yes, and I also got an awful lot of cookbooks that were heart healthy type okay. cookbooks. The American Cancer Society has a good one. American Heart Association has a good one. Dean Ornish had a good one. And my favorite was the Martha Shulman book. So I definitely changed a lot of things, but the rehab program was, was paramount. Also, friends came and took me for a walk every day so that I would not go back and, and relinquish the exercise. And I was actually walking 14 minute miles in those days. Wow, so that's great. So before you had had the heart issues, were you doing any exercise? None, zero, zip. Zero. <laughs> so you were eating, you really were a poster child for heart disease at that time. You were working long hours, eating foods high in fat, no exercise, lots of stress. Yes. It must have been really difficult to make all these changes. Um, it was challenging, I will say that. I would not use the word difficult. Okay. Because I think the motivation was there, and I think when you're motivated, difficult things become much easier. Right, and you did have a very good thing that you were looking at. You wanted your husband, you wanted to live a long life. Right. So you had lots of motivation. I had lots of motivation, I still do. Now, you had said that you were looking at two different programs, the 12 week, and what else did you do? Um, the other program was the Meyer Friedman program. Okay. Um, Meyer Friedman, back in 1972, together with his head nurse, uh, he was a, a, an MD, a cardiologist in San Francisco, and uh, with his head nurse in 1972, he wrote a book called Type A Behavior and Your Heart. It's still available. Um, it's a little paperback, you can get it in a little paperback, okay. probably pick it up anywhere. And um, he started a program, the Meyer Friedman Institute in San Francisco, uh, to change type A behavior. And uh, type A behavior is characterized by the the yeah the, I was going to say leg that, and I'm the, a type A the, so I can imagine that's drumming pretty the, hard yes, to the, change type A personalities yes, into something it's, else. It's not type A personality; oh, it's type okay. A behavior. behavior. And they make a big distinction okay. in, in that. But what it amounted to was that I went through a three and a half hour interview just to be accepted into the program because they won't take you if they don't think you're capable of change. They did take me almost, I, I was in that program for eight months 
and um, it, again, it was a lot of, um, I guess you could call it group therapy, okay. because uh, we met in gr small groups of five to seven people, maybe ten, and uh, we had a leader that talked to us about certain things, and um, a little bit, we had lots of meditation in that program. I remember falling asleep on my chair, <laughs> but um, I, I'm not good at the meditating. I'm, I'm getting better at it. I, I don't actually meditate, but I, yeah. I think meditation, for so many, th we think that we have to do it a certain way. Right. And I think really what it's about is just quieting our minds, mm -hmm. maybe not doing quite as much, right. stopping to smell the roses, a Very bit definitely. More. Yes. So yes. I think that yeah. that helps a lot. It, it's it's a mindset more than it is a a setting, a physical setting or a physical position. Or I mean, you don't have to sit there like you're in a yoga pose right. or something. But just quieting your mind down, I think, and and taking some time to to um, get the stress out and and think about things that are pleasant. Maybe focus uh, on your breath a little mm -hmm. bit more. Breath, absolutely. Breathing, big deal. So what else did you learn in that program? In the Meyer Friedman program, um, I think one of the things I learned, uh, one of the exercises was to choose the longest line at the grocery store and stand in it quietly and without tapping your foot. I'm still not real good at that. <laughs> but um, I learned to be more patient with myself and I learned I guess the biggest lesson of all was that perfection doesn't exist and it's damaging to constantly seek it Why? because it damages the psyche, it damages your self-esteem, it damages your, your, your stress level goes up so that's damaging, um, important. Now, Ellen, I know you're a very happy person. Every time I've always seen you, you always have a big smile on your face. So how do you live your life with so much joy? Well, I think um, as I look back on my life, uh, it hasn't always been filled with joy. But I think that when you, when you focus on the good things, you get more of what you focus on. We, we get more of what we focus on regardless. Right. So if we focus on the negative, we get more of the negative. We bring it back to us, the law of attraction. And if we focus on the positive, we get more of the positive. And I have made extraordinary strides in focusing on the positive um, in my life. And I, I try to do that each day. Uh, I've started keeping a journal a couple of years ago. Someone gave me one for my birthday and it sat sort of on my bedside table for a couple of months before I opened it and then I picked up a pen and started writing in it and it was a, a joyful experience in itself. But I try to find something each day at the end of each day. I like to do it in the evenings when I'm ready to go to bed and it kind of quiets my mind and I like to talk about what or write about what I what I found joyful in the day and I think it puts you to sleep in a in a good mood you sleep better and you wake up refreshed and and you feel that the your day has been worthwhile I like to be productive uh, that's a big thing for me to to feel productive at the end of each day and to count my blessings and I definitely do that I'm 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 blessed I have a, a beautiful home I have lovely friends I have wonderful people in my life I have a supportive family and um, my my business is booming, and I'm 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 just ever so grateful. There's so much good in my life, so I am grateful for it. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think it's really important. I know that I practice with a gratitude journal too, and it makes a world of difference because, like you said, what we focus on, we get more of. Exactly. So when we're focused on things that we're grateful for, even on those days that are sometimes tough and difficult to get through. It, we can always find something that was good about the day. I so agree. I have a little calendar on my desk that one of my suppliers gives me each year. In fact, I'm going to have lunch with her today. Um, and it has a saying for each day. And one day it had a saying that said, at the end of each day, ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, how was your day? Oh. And I started grading each day in my journal. So the very last thing I write is today was a nine or today was an eight plus or something like that. 
And I found that I went back through my journal recently and um, I've never had a day lower than a seven. That's a really bad day for me. Wow. So I think that's pretty good. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with <laughs> us. Now I know you do a lot of traveling also and you do a lot of traveling by yourself. Yes, I do. And one of the things that I wanted to share with the audience is your view of that because as we get older and as so many people get older, tr <clears throat> loneliness is difficult. So how do you travel by yourself and yet not be lonely? Well, first of all, I love to travel. Um, I'm always up for something new, a new place, and I enjoy going back to places that I've enjoyed in the past as well. So my travel is, is not always exploratory. Sometimes it's going back to places that I dearly love. But um, I'm a widow now. My husband, my beautiful, wonderful Bill died um, not quite two years ago. I miss him terribly, but life goes on. And I think it's very, very important to have a good attitude about yourself. I'm comfortable with myself. I did a lot of traveling business-wise in my earlier, younger days. And um, I did a lot of that travel was alone, but it was very purposeful travel. Now my travel is both business and, and, and joyful, uh, fun stuff, vacations, uh, mixed in with business. And I find that if you like yourself and your self-esteem is there, that what you really have is the joy of just being in, in wherever you are, whatever place you're in. I can always find a museum. I love museums. Uh, you don't need a pal to go to the museum. You don't need a pal to go to the movies. You can't talk anyway. The first thing they tell you is, please don't talk. You know? Such good points. Thank you <laughs> so, so much for sharing that yeah, with us. Um, and we're running out of time. Okay. And I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us Thank today. You. If somebody watching this show would like to get in contact with you, can they do that? Yes, of course. And how would they do that? I have a website. Um, it's Ellen Wilcox at, excuse me, it's at ellenwilcox.com, that's okay. all. And that will take you to my web website. And also my email is available, ellen at ellenwilcox.com. And um, they can check out my website and Great. I'm happy to talk to anyone. Thanks. For especially about good health. Great, thank you so much for joining us today, Ellen. Thank you for having me, Tracy, it's been a pleasure. Together, we make a difference one story at a time. You can find out more about World Wellness Education at worldwellnesseducation.org. It is estimated that the average person consumes about 612 ounce servings of soft drinks each year. Kids are drinking more and more of these sugary beverages. And it doesn't help that every place they purchase a soft drink continues to sell larger and larger beverage sizes. The soft drink industry has done an amazing job of target marketing. The annual growth in soft drink consumption by kids and young adults in the United States is 25%. Consumption of soft drinks since 1978 has tripled for boys and doubled for girls. So why is this important? Soft drinks could be defined as liquid candy. The ingredients include sugar, high fructose corn syrup, aspartame, caffeine, artificial flavors, citric acid, and phosphoric acid. There often is no nutritional value at all. An average serving of soda is approximately 200 calories. This is approximately 10% of the calories needed on a daily basis. To put it simply, our children are consuming 10% or more of the calories they need to grow and develop with calories that have no nutritional value. Let's take a look at the individual ingredients. Ingesting large amounts of refined sugar is known to be a factor in causing diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, tooth decay, and ADHD. Harvard University researchers reported in The Lancet, a British medical journal, the first evidence linking soft drink consumption to childhood obesity. 
This research indicated that 12-year-old children who regularly drink soft drinks are more likely to be overweight than those children who do not drink these sugary beverages. They also found that each additional daily serving of soft drinks increased the risk of obesity more than one and a half times. A federally funded study of nearly 3,200 Americans ages 9 to 29 conducted between 1971 and 1974 showed a direct link between tooth decay and soft drinks. Numerous other studies throughout the world show this same link. High fructose corn syrup also is known to be a factor in obesity. Princeton University conducted a study of rats and found that those fed high fructose corn syrup gained weight 300% faster than their counterparts. Consuming high fructose corn syrup is associated with the development of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high levels of bad cholesterol, long-term liver damage, and mercury exposure. In fact, a study found that over 50% of samples of high fructose corn syrup contain mercury. Mercury is known to cause irreversible brain and nervous system damage. Many turn to diet drinks to avoid weight gain. However, NutraSweet and aspartame are neurotoxins associated with 92 different health problems. The primary problems include brain cancer and brain tumors. Aspartame has been found to worsen the symptoms of MS, ADHD, diabetes, chronic fatigue, osteoporosis, menopause, and Alzheimer's. Caffeine is highly addictive, acts as a stimulant, causes insomnia, and is associated with high blood pressure and an irregular heartbeat. Along with these issues, consumption of caffeine can deplete your vitamin and minerals. Artificial flavors and citric acid often contain monosodium glutamate. This risk associated with ingestion of MSG and other ingredients that contain MSG are simple and straightforward. Brain damage, endocrine disorders, obesity, reproductive disorders, behavior disorders, and neurodegenerative disease. Phosphoric acid interferes with calcium absorption and eats away the enamel of your teeth. A 1994 Harvard study indicated that young women who consumed soft drinks were five times more likely to suffer broken bones than their counterparts who did not have soft drinks. If all of this wasn't bad enough, there are even more negative effects of drinking soda that I won't cover now. However, I hope that you will decide that it's time to examine your soft drink habit. This information is not meant to be medical advice. No action or inaction should be taken solely on the contents of this information. Instead, you should consult appropriate health professionals on any matter relating to your health and well-being. Thanks for joining us. Remember you can catch this show each week on Lakefront TV. And to find out more about World Wellness Education, check out our website at worldwellnesseducation.org. We'll see you next time. This episode of World Wellness Education is made possible by a production grant from the Milhorn Law Firm. We at the Milhorn Law Firm believe that important decisions and planning should not be put on hold. These planning decisions affect not only you, but your children and heirs. My name is Eric Milhorn. I'm one of seven attorneys here at the Milhorn Law Firm. We've been very fortunate we've been able to serve the Central Florida area for a period of over 20 years. All the attorneys at the Milhorn Law Firm live in this area and are proud to call this area our home. The Milhorn Law Firm, the law firm you know and trust.